today. Um, on its face, you wouldn't quite, and, and reading the syllabus, you may have wondered why a theater director, an opera director, should be here speaking at a course about the food movement. Um, and I asked Peter that question, and he says, well, you need all types, including the unqualified in this movement, um, to really make it go. And I think there's something to that. It is an amateur movement in the best sense. Um, I'm not going to go talk about his achievements, which are reflected in the syllabus. They're considerable, they're amazing, and this will really depress you. Many of them began while he was your age, uh, when he began staging important works of the canon at, um, at some of our best repertory theaters in America as a college student at Harvard. Um, since then, he has uh, fulfilled all the early promise he, he uh, manifested, but he's done a lot of things that you may be less aware of. He's taught a legendary class at UCLA in art and social change. Um, and in fact, during one semester of that class, he, he, he did uh, an entire semester on food issues and agriculture. And I had the honor of, of, of attending it, as did Alice Waters and Eric Schlosser. And so actually, he's given a whole lot of thought to these issues. Um, but I think why it's particularly interesting to hear from him is he has a very expansive view as to what politics are and the relationship of art and politics, which he sees as intimately entwined. And if we are to change consciousness around food, we're going to need the skills not just of the politician or the activist, but of the artist, uh, of the brilliant metaphor and the stunning event. And, um, and, and that's why uh, Nikki and I both thought that this was a very important voice for you to hear. Um, in my mind, I think of, of, of Peter, I've been trying to think of the right biological metaphor for him, and I thought for a while he was an, he's an enzyme. I mean, he's a, uh, you know, he's a molecular catalyst. But then I thought, well, enzymes kind of break things down. They take complicated molecules and break them into simpler ones. And that's one of the things he does. But he also brings things together, and he ferments change. And then I decided he's more like a yeast. Um, <laughs> And he is a yeast. I mean, he starts with the substrate of a Shakespeare play or an, or an opera, and he ferments it. And it ends up something recognizable but very different. But then looking at him, there's some electrical metaphor we need, too, obviously. So you'll, you'll decide on the proper metaphor after you've heard him. But please join me in welcoming Peter Sellers. Hey everyone, nice to see everyone. Welcome to class number two. Now we're gonna get real. Uh, we just have to, I need to know why you're taking this class, right? Because of course it's easy, it's fun, who knows? But obviously something else is really going on in the world. And we're here, I mean here on earth, to move things, to change things, to transform things. The nightmare with education in your generation was the idea was education was something to prepare you for a career so you could make money and have quote unquote security. Today I really want tonight to deal direct with two things which are truth and art and beauty. <laughs> because actually they're really important. We're living in a period where you're mostly surrounded by lies and most everything you encounter is propaganda. Somebody's trying to convince you of something. So everything is front loaded and basically what you're hearing is money talk. And when money talks, it has a very narrow range of subject matter. I really want to emphasize that money and life are not related. And anyone confusing money and life is going to have a really sad life. My generation had a strange situation. When we graduated from college, Citibank was waiting to hire us. The devil was there saying, sign on this dotted line. Your generation doesn't have that problem because you won't have any jobs. <laughs> now that's fantastic and truly liberating. 
right? Welcome to the meltdown, <laughs> right? You watch the economy be propped up ridiculously a couple years ago, and guess what? 10 seconds later, it collapsed all over again. Why would that be? Perhaps because it is actually, by definition, unsustainable. We're doing things that actually never worked ever. And we're always bad for most people. And the reason in your lifetime all this stuff is collapsing around you is because it was never good. And never good enough. In our generation, it's not a question of going back to some time when this was done well. It has never been done well enough. And so the collapse means how do we reinvent something way better than it ever was? How do we reimagine it? There is no such thing as a social sphere in the United States of America right now. That has been destroyed. The idea of public life and public space, everything has been privatized. There's a law that you can't stand longer than five minutes on a piece of pavement. Everything is for sale, especially including democracy. And we're now in this marvelous period where democracy is kind of a nostalgic concept, but we're in the Greece of post-Pericles, right? Where there was democracy and then it turned into what the eight richest people want to see. And we're there now again. And so you have to know what you're doing. Because all the things you grew up with that are written on the post office turn out not to be true, and maybe there won't even be a post office soon. So we really have to get serious about thinking what we're doing and how we're doing it. And it's not just that you're going to flow out of this institution into a series of situations that are waiting for you. They're actually not waiting for you, and you're going to have to invent them. Which is really cool. What I explain usually to my students at UCLA is the way you can tell the difference between something that needs to be done and something that does not need to be done. Anything you can get paid for does not need to be done. Anything for which no job currently exists is urgent. And so not only do you have to invent your job, you have to invent the ecology that supports it. And I'm using the word ecology instead of the word economy. Because the word economy is a crisis. You had last week Carlo Petrini nailing that word. Because we're not alive, we're not on earth to be part of an economy. And the idea that you are looking at the entire world through a set of glasses that have grids and spreadsheets, and you're judging good and bad based on numbers, is an ethical crisis. The Greeks could smell that money was going to destroy democracy. And therefore, Euripides and Sophocles, in play after play, in every play, there would be speech against money. Euripides would say, no one could possibly confuse money and freedom. Because money is slavery, not freedom. What I want to deal with tonight is the non-cash economy, which is the only thing that actually functions and has ever functioned that keeps the planet going, which are all the things you do not because someone pays you, but because they're in your heart and you choose to do them, because they're who you are, because in the act of doing them, you become yourself. In the act of doing them, you tell yourself who you are and what you care about. And you make time for them because there's nothing more important in your life. And no one can pay you to do them because the reward is you finally get to meet yourself. Who you're hiding from most of the day, most days of the week. The self you've been waiting to meet. 
emerges when you do something that you're not paid for. That is an act of love, it's an act of generosity, it's an act of giving, and it's an act of self-definition. You learn what kind of person you are. All the other stuff is distraction energy from your actual identity. And you don't know what your real identity is till you look at how you actually spend your time that is non-coercive. What you choose to do with the time that belongs to you and how much of your life you turn into time that belongs to you as opposed to something that is like our democracy for sale. And where you go through your life doing things that people pay you to do because you yourself are for sale. Like some actor who produces real tears for the AT&T commercial. So if you can cry for an AT&T commercial, what is the value of a human tear? What part of you is not for sale? What part of you cannot be purchased? What part of you is beyond price? What part of you is actually you? And what part of you do you find by the quality of interaction with someone else? Who are the people who shaped your life? How did you let them in? How did you participate in shaping their lives? I just, let's start off with just a little poem from amazing South Indian poet, Ravati Devi. With the fragrance of 25 bodies burning with desire, with the beauty of five snow-clad mountain ranges, with the moving music of infinite pairs of stellar bodies, with the love of a thousand brilliant dark eyes, with the cool rays of a billion moons, with two valleys red with passion, with a hundred joys of the soft green grass, with a trillion stars of sparkling looks, with the thirst of 40 youthful sons with a single heart for a single heart now I am born you came into the world with everything you are infinite being we're living in this economy of scarcity and poverty but in fact what the Buddhists call the four immeasurables are what's real there will always be enough love you're not going to run out. You're carrying it with you. There's plenty. There's no shortage. There's absolutely no shortage of courage. It's infinite. You're carrying with you an infinite amount of courage. Right now. You are not a speck a dot, a position on a piece of paper, a number in an, in an opinion poll. You in your nature are infinite. Huge. The reason we do theater is to remind people, as in Hamlet or Electra, a human being is immense. A human being is overwhelming. A human being, we don't even begin to know the possibilities. And you are directly empowered. Now, how is it that we live in a society that has convinced everybody the opposite? That you're nothing, you have no voice, and you make no difference. Tonight, what I want to talk about and deal with is how you start a movement. In the arts, you start a movement with three people who care about something and who care deeply and want to live another way. And you don't look around and say, oh, gee, no one else is doing that, so I guess we won't. You actually ask yourself every minute of every day, how do you want to live and what do you want in your life, right? There are three steps to being an artist. 
Okay? Step number one. Yes, please write this down. This is urgent. Step number one. Imagine the world you want to live in. Okay, so that first act of imagination is you're looking around. You don't see what you're looking for, right? And that's what our rule as artists is what is missing from this picture. Put it there. Step number one is that act of imagination of seeing what's not here yet. Right? As an artist, you look at that blank piece of paper and you see the poem that isn't there yet, the painting that's not there yet, the drawing that's not there yet, and once it's, you put it there, it will be in this world. And it's waiting for you to invite it to step into this world. It's there. It just needs to come through you so we can share it. It's not here yet. Step number one, imagine the world you want to live in. Step number two, create that world. Step number three, live in it. Now, Michael was dealing powerfully with the problematic of hard and soft power. I want to talk about how soft hard actually is and how hard soft really is. Because, frankly... You know, the Quran says this all the time, you know, because when you go around in the deserts in North Africa and the Middle East, you see just ruin after ruin. And the Quran says those people thought they would last forever and they were important. And it's just a ruin. None of the powers of this world endure. They're on very temporary basis. And don't be impressed because the establishment never was established and never will be. <laughs> In fact, they're as freaked out as everyone. More so. They just can't admit it. Meanwhile, there's something else we're doing that is long-lasting and that actually moves across generations and doesn't lose its power and actually gathers moral force and actually begins to add up differently. When you're listening to what's on TV <laughs> or what some press conference from, you know, the Republican, uh, 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 you know, congressional caucus is coming up with, it's just really important to remember that no matter how many times you repeat a lie, it will not be true. A lie will actually always be a lie. Right? And the truth actually isn't going to not be true tomorrow. It's going to remain true. This class and this food movement are about the difference between living your life based on a truth or living your life based on a lie. And how you participate in extending the lie or you participate in extending the truth. And the crucial component, which is why we're on earth, is to create more justice. Every day in your life, what actions are you, are you participating in, are you initiating that create more justice? And what are the actions that you are an accomplice in creating less justice and going along with the fact that this is really unequal? Loathsome. We have tripled world poverty in 25 years during your lifetime on Earth. Now, if you don't notice that, and if that makes no difference to you, I have a problem. What kind of person are you that you just don't notice and you just go on? That people are starving who have never been starving ever. That people are in jail who have never been in jail before. That we now have more slaves than in the lifetime of Abraham Lincoln or indeed at any previous time in the history of the planet. Right? This is the height of world slavery right now in your lifetime. Now that can matter to you or not. You can just be clueless. 
And a hundred years from now, people will say, what were people thinking? You know, the same way, you know, Steven Spielberg can get half and say, did they not notice Auschwitz? Okay, so what are we not noticing? What are we not noticing? How is it that you're alive now and not noticing? And I'm not talking about Africa. I'm talking about South Central Los Angeles. Shocking absence of equal justice. And rolling back every year. A hundred years from now, people will say, what were they thinking that they didn't notice? How could you live in the middle of that and not notice? And how could you live with yourself to say nothing of how could you live with that society? Now, because we are so in the thrall of marketing campaigns and propaganda, we are so sure that we don't have a voice and that we don't matter because the numbers tell you that millions of people are doing this, so that's just going to be the way it is. What it means to be an artist and what it means to be an activist is to ignore the numbers. It's not about a business plan. It's about a plan of how you can live with yourself and how you can live with your friends and how you might actually diversify your friends and have a wider range of friends and how friendship might mean something really deep like getting somebody out of jail after 25 years or making sure their kids have something to eat. And wherever you are creating a zone of justice that is your being and is who you are. And every action you undertake is an action that creates more justice. Which is why for me food is a culture. And why I want to talk to you tonight just about understanding it culturally. Which is just like in Hebrew culture or in traditional Muslim culture traditional Hindu culture, we actually live our lives based on rituals, on habit energy, right? That's what the Buddhists call it. All the things you do every day without thinking is how you spend most of your life, right? And you do the same set of three things every day, right? You go to the same three places, you talk to the same three people, you know, everything is like this incredible bubble of habit energy. You have your habit and you're into it and you repeat it over and over and over again. How can you diversify and activate your habit energy so instead of just as a habit doing dumb stuff that perpetuates more dishonor and degradation, you actually make your habit energy refined so that every single thing you do has to do with justice. So in the Hebrew tradition, like classic, serious, Orthodox Hebrew tradition, the way you tie your shoe, the way you put your hair is an act of consciousness, is an act of remembering God, is an act of connecting to your spiritual self. And so there are all these rules for how you eat, all these rules for how you put your shoe on, all these rules for how you put your hat on, because you do everything consciously. It's actually designed to be that everything you do has with it consciousness. I would extend that in Tibetan Buddhist tradition with everything you do also is dedicated. Before you take a bite of soup, you dedicate that bite of soup to someone. Before you perform an action, you dedicate that action to someone you want to honor or help or remember or love so that you get used to realizing that you're not living for yourself and that every single thing you do, you dedicate to someone. So you are living and acting and being in recognition of others. And every single gesture is dedicated. And once you dedicate that gesture, guess what? It becomes way more beautiful. And you taste that soup. You just scarf stuff down. 
You don't just do stuff without thinking. Suddenly, every single thing you do or touch becomes aware, alive, morally charged, and charged with the senses. Because one of the best shocking things about being alive in this period where most people are eating cardboard boxes instead of food is your senses are dulled. They're not just trying to dull your mind, they're trying to dull your senses. Because your senses also tell you what's wrong. And when you notice your sense of touch is gone, you're in trouble, right? When you notice you're not tasting most things you're eating, you're in trouble. What that moment is of sharpened, heightened consciousness, where you actually taste, where you actually feel, where you understand everything you're doing is about feeling. In fact, you're not a rational being at all. The nightmare of the education system has been to you know, present this male superstructure of rationality, which is ridiculous. We're totally rational beings. Every single decision you've ever made in your life is irrational, right? completely, excuse me, like 100% irrational. The question is, how well do you know your irrational self? That's why the arts exist. Because it's your irrational self you need to know, not your rational self. How your irrational self is moving you and how that irrational self lets you do unimaginably beautiful, courageous things because everything on earth tells you rationally this makes no sense. And yet you do something anyway because it's an act of beauty. I want to emphasize beauty because one of the most irritating things about the food discussion right now is, you know, feeding more people as if, you know, more cardboard stuff stuffed in more mouths help something. The New York Times restaurant critic attacking Alice Waters last week. What does Alice Waters think? That poor people in America's economic meltdown will pay more for a vegetable because it's good? We have to not have this mechanized idea of what food is doing in our lives. I want to just read from the Upanishads, which you guys know, right? Which is the pre-Vedic Hindu texts, right? From like before, well, who knows what the dates are? It's from time immemorial, and it's what people sang in India. Farmers sang this stuff, eventually was written down. Upanishad means at the feet of, right? It's already an incredible idea in life that you would actually respect someone. Respect food. Life is food. Body lives on food. Body is life. Life is body. They are food to one another. Food, when eaten, is changed into three qualities. The greatest, no, the grossest, start that again, food when eaten is changed into three qualities, right? Not quantities, qualities. The grossest becomes excrement. The finest, mind. Whatever is midway, flesh. The finest quality of curds, when churned, rises up as butter. So the finest quality of the food we swallow rises up as mind. The finest quality of the water we swallow rises up as life.
the finest quality of the light we swallow rises up as speech. Right? Your speech comes from light and enlightenment. What it means to be enlightened when you speak. Remember, mind comes from food. Life comes from water. Speech comes from light. Now, in the Hindu tradition, it is basically a spiritual crime to eat alone. It's understood that what food does is bring people together and create a space that is shared. And that the act of food is the act of sharing. And there are two crimes in Hindu tradition. One is to eat alone is a crime. Never turn anyone from the door, gather enough food, say to the stranger, Sir, the dinner is served. He who gives with purity gets purity in return. He who gives with passion gets passion in return. He who gives with ignorance gets ignorance in return. Step one, not just of your relation to the earth and the planet, but of your relation to any other human being, is where's the shared space? What is shared? First step of sharing is food. Every time you eat, what are you sharing? And how are you sharing it? How are you charging that as shared space? This is a beautiful South Indian poem from the 12th century called Ungiving. My eyes look away in shame. My hand shrinks back. My mouth, normally quite mobile, just won't open. It's all a waste. Even my bones seem aflame when a person serves food without love. My eyes look away in shame, my hand shrinks back, my mouth, normally quite mobile, just won't open. It's all a waste. Even my bones seem aflame when a person serves food without love. The amount of loveless food <laughs> that is swirling around this planet. As Carlo told you, to be wasted. <laughs> That's why to discuss food as a commodity, even Bill Clinton realized was a mistake. Bill, like 10 years after being president, finally said, we got it wrong. We thought food was like color television sets. It isn't, it's culture, it's meaning. Food is meaning, food is mind, food is identity, food is community, food is society. Food is love, food is justice. Which is why a beautiful vegetable that was raised by somebody who cares isn't just expensive. It actually changes your life. And a sad vegetable raised by a machine, you are eating that quality of mind. Not only is it dulling your senses, it is damaging your mind. And the damage is moral, which Michael and Eric and many other people will talk about better than me, of literally who grew that strawberry. K 
can you taste the multiple cancers that that deported migrant worker has? And can you taste the miscarriage from the fields in Oxnard, here in California, where we have people working in the fields without citizenship, with carcinogens, with no rights, expendable, throwaway people. When you taste your strawberry picked by that person, can you taste the cancer? Can you taste the miscarriage? Can you taste all of that bad karma? See, America thinks we have the highest standard of living because we have all this stuff. We actually have the lowest standard of living in human history because all of this stuff comes as a series of crimes and grotesque, evil, karmic, bad, 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 bad vibes. Which is why the society that eats better than any society in human history, quote unquote, in terms of quantity, we have more stuff than anyone ever had ever. Why this society of all societies is 100% panicked, has analysts, has to go, you know, deal with how freaked out they are every minute. Because guess what? All your stuff is freaking you out. Because everything you touch brings with it the bad karma of who made it under horrible conditions. And so when you're chewing that food, you are ingesting the karma and the quali quality of mind that goes with the fate of the people who produced it. Because, as you probably figured out, in this life, nothing is an object. Everything is a being. Everything is charged with moral energy. Everything is charged with power. And how you handle it is the question. And can you yourself create a zone of purity? As the Upanishad said, when you give with purity, you get purity. When you give with generosity, you get generosity. When you give with ignorance, you get ignorance. How much ignorance are you keeping in circulation? And where's the quality of mind that you're actually bringing into the world? Quality of mind is a quality of concentration. And what I want to say about the creation of beauty is what it simply means is to concentrate. Most of us just don't concentrate on anything. We are so damn distracted every single second you're thinking 45 things, you can't control your own mind. Yes, it would be nice if McDonald's didn't exist, but of course you want to go there, so you're there. Right? All the weird contradictions you want to blame some corporation for. I'm sorry, it's not the corporation. The corporation's, you know, you're buying that stuff. It's not some corporate evil. It's your own divided heart. Right? And they're marketing to your divided self. Because you actually think one thing and do something else every single day. Thousands of times. And the question is, as it is in traditional... Hindu practice, can you put your belief system into your body? Or, as is the magnificent genius of the Western educational system, do you just continue to say beautiful things while living completely differently? Thinking beautiful thoughts and living completely another way. What does it mean to put your belief system into your body? and actually live based on what you believe most deeply. Not at some future time, but now. The filmmaker Tarkovsky had this marvelous thing of, you know, the person who tells you that they were just making this movie now so one day they can make the movie they want to make will never make the movie they want to make. Right? May I just emphasize, not only in my own pathetic life, as, as Michael mentioned, but in fact, it's the case with nuclear physicists. 
you make your great breakthroughs before the age of 25. This is prime time right now for you. It's not going to get better. There is no later. There's only right now. And the decision you make about your life right now is going to be how you live. And your failure to make that decision right now will mean you will never live that way. This is the time you are forming and shaping your habit energy, and you're setting yourself up for the rest of your life right now. And you decide to do this right now or next Tuesday. There will be no next Tuesday. And could I really emphasize what Howard Zinn said? Whatever freedom or democracy we have in the world did not come from people who had jobs. They came from people who went on strike, who went on picket lines. Did not come from people in the White House, came from people in front of the White House. Please understand the power, and it's just like the power of being an artist is the power of starting a farm is choosing to live another way. And guess what? That creates a movement. It looks like you're lonely. You're not. It's actually a real simple thing. You say, this is what I want in my life, and so I'm going to live in this way. Eventually, it becomes the kind of shoe everyone has to wear. But it starts as just people making a decision. And the economy follows them. You don't follow the economy. Right? It's like when you're making your first movie, you don't go after a famous star, you create the next star. You don't have the money to buy the current star, but you're going to make someone you love into the next star. Right? You're going to do that right now. And you're not going to do it in a bitter, angry, or oppositional way, because the power of the food movement is it's not oppositional. And this is a real shock, because previous movements, like what separates it from the 60s, the protest movement, is what we're against. Okay? Oppositional, bad oppositional energy is actually what's paralyzing this country right now. Don't, don't get sucked into it. It is absolutely a black hole. It is a dead zone. When I'm talking about these acts of love and these acts of generosity and inclusivity and equality, what we're talking about with equality is the very person who you hate most and most hates you was also created by God. You need to find a zone of equality with that person. You need to find a shared table with that person. You need to break bread with the very people you hate the most because until you do, nothing's going to move anywhere. And as long as you are thinking and functioning oppositionally, you are part of the problem, and there will not be any solution. And the solution and the power of this movement is the power of what food always represented. It's a quality of mind and a quality of sharing. And what sharing means is not just sharing with your friends, but reimagining who your friends are. And beginning to say, excuse me, the terrorist who wants to kill you also eats three times a day and also want their, wants their kids not to eat poison. This movement is about what we share and how we share. And to redo every part of your own personal philosophy to shake down the stupid oppositional mindset that you've been, that has been stuffed into you and turn it all around to radical and creative sharing. Radical and creative sharing with your friends and your enemies. And building a shared platform that lets us all move forward as equals. Not with yourself as superior to everybody else, because they're not enlightened, but finding and creating that table and breaking bread with the very people who are out to destroy everything you love. The act of radical generosity, inclusive, inclusiveness, and maybe I'll just close do not steal food. 
Water is food. Light lives on water. Water is light. Light is water. They're food for one another. Store food. Earth is food. Air lives on earth. Earth is air. Air is earth. They're food for one another. Burugu, seeking his father, Waruna said, Lord, what is spirit? Waruna said, first know food. Life, seeing, hearing, speaking, thinking. That is the spirit from whom all things are born, by whom they live, towards whom they move, into whom they return. May I just say that more clearly? Food is the spirit from which all things are born, literally. That's not a metaphor. Food is the spirit from which all things are born, by whom they live, towards whom they move, into whom they return. Let's have some questions. And let's have some Thank you, Peter. And as Alex moves these three lovely chairs to the center of the stage for us, can you hear me? Yes, okay. I wanted to reflect a bit. I get to do that, seeing as how I'm the professor, but don't you dare reflect before asking a question. All you do is ask questions, like last week. Um, Michael started out talking about the history of the environmental movement and what happened in the 70s and some of the things that galvanized the food movement. And for me, working at People's Grocery, some of the history that we think about was actually some of the themes that Peter brought up. Creating a zone of justice around you. Money and life are not, created, or are not related, and what part of you is for sale. So part of my history with the food movement is that in the late 60s, a group of guys got together and formed the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and ended up feeding 250,000 children with their free breakfast program without any kind of government support and just based on donations. And that program either pressured or encouraged, depending on how you see the history, the government to adopt a very similar program. Around the same time, the United Farm Worker Movement started pressuring people to pay them fairly Around the same time, a lot of black nationalist movements were feeding the people when they didn't have access to food. So there are legacies of people who have created that zone of justice around them, who have different types of friends, and who are trying to create solutions. So all of you students, when it came to the readings and when it came to those questions and thinking about equity, where is that history? And what does it look like? What are the tangible examples that you've seen of what creating a zone of justice wherever you walk looks like. So that'll be my reflection to open up the question and answer period. And as before, students are gonna be able to ask the first couple of questions and then we'll open it up to everyone else. Mike, Michael or I will repeat the question and then we will see where it goes. We will start here and then go back there. I want to go back to the beginning of Peter's lecture when you talk about what part of you is not for sale. And I'd like to know what you think about uh, trying to find a balance between making a living and living. Can I answer that question? One of my favorite things that I hope will soon become one of your favorite things is Indian Drupad music. I don't know why tonight's an in, a night about India. But Drupad is this chanting that goes 
actually dates back to the Upanishads, but is more powerful because it has no words. Because in India, it's understood that words are very imprecise, and music is actually very precise. And sound, you can actually heal people with. Sound is powerful and reorganizes people's interiors. And so Drupad is this art of chanting. I finally met the two great, the Dagar brothers, D-A-G-A-R, who it's been a dynasty in their family. They live in Bhopal and for 500 years. And this chanting is unbelievable. I finally met them and had dinner with them. And, uh, you know, they're the most, you know, strange, exotic, unimaginable people. And so I said, well, you know, I, I can't believe I'm finally sitting, having dinner with you. This was in Europe. And uh, where are you coming from? And they said, well, we've just spent six months in Los Angeles. So that was my big idea of romantic India. And I said, well now, how can you, you know, the Drupad singing is so slow and so deep. How can you practice this thing, this slow art form in Los Angeles where everything is fast? And <laughs> Wasfuddin Dagar looked right through me with piercing eyes and said, the world is always slow. Only your mind is fast. <laughs> the pace at which a child grows or a tree grows or the sun moves through the sky is slow. If you're watching it, you don't see it happen. Everything real is slow. So I thought, okay, right, okay. So they have a school in Bhopal. Asking him about Bhopal was pretty intense. Anyway, the big deal, I said, well, tell me about your school. They said, well, we get up very early, about 3 a.m., and start chanting when the low notes are best. And then gradually the job is to sing into being the day. And you start at the darkest time when there will be no future. It's darkest and coldest. That famous time when the crucial prayer is offered in Islam, the prayer that brings the day into being. And you chant up the sun, first in cold darkness and gradually with the dawn. And then you cook breakfast. And what they teach the students in the school is cooking, because you would never ever accept money for your art. You chant for free and you will work as a cook. And so the, it's a cooking school. You find a way in which you make a living by feeding people one way and with every other part of your energy you try and feed people another way. And everything you're doing is feeding people. Is that an answer? <laughs> Gentlemen back there, we will... <laughs> Hi. Um, I suppose this question is for all three of you. Um, Peter, your comment regarding the New York Times criticism of um, Alice Waters really struck me. Um, how, how do we, um, I suppose, combine or, or address the, um, the fact that food is a socially important and um, something that needs to be valued? How do we combine that with the simple fact that local well-grown food on an absolute dollar level tends to be more expensive and restaurants like Alice's tend to be $140 a meal? I'm so glad you asked that question, because I saw it hovering like a big thought bubble over everyone, where he said, you're never going to have a job, and you're never going to need any money, and, and never earn any money, and that you must eat food with good karma. <laughs> and I think that really is a very hard question. Um, and uh, as much as that article uh, disturbed me also, um, I don't think the food movement has yet come up with good answers to, the, to that question, um, I have to say. I think that there are many ways to kind of nibble at it, nibble around at it. Um, I think we mistake 
uh, quantity for quality when it comes to food. And I think that as a society, eating more consciously, as Peter was talking about, I think that is incredibly important. And, 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 and making food sacramental again makes it something that um, less is more. Um, less of it is more satisfying. But that's not a political message that you can bring to anyone who can't afford to put food on the table. Um, so I don't have an easy answer to that question. I think that it is in some ways unfair to lay that at the, at the foot of the food movement only because one of the reasons that cardboard food, what Peter was talking about, is is so cheap and good food is so expensive has to do with a whole system that we're going to be learning about over the course of the of the semester. Um, it isn't naturally that way. Um, it's been constructed that way by a, a, a set of choices we've made as a society, m most of which none of us subscribe to. Um, but the problem we've gotten into is that having figured out a way to make cardboard food really inexpensive, by the way, cheaper than um, food has ever been. When I, and when I talk about meat, um, you know, meat, is, meat has always been a very um, uh, expensive food in, in many, many senses. But we figured out a way to make it cheap by doing it in ways that are uh, unconscionable uh, and exploitive. Um, but having done that and having gotten a whole society hooked on such food, it's very hard to go back because our whole society, in a way, what, what allows the whole system to go on is the fact that the poor can feed themselves at least badly. Um, so that cheap food is now a pillar of the whole system. Uh, and is the reason that people put up with falling wages in America since the 1970s, is that the price of food was falling also, so people could, could bear it. So then the question becomes, how do we go back? We have to put enough money in people's hands that they can afford to buy the food that's been grown with care and without exploitation. So you see, it's a problem of the whole society, not just of the food movement. That's a, that's a short answer. We'll do more with it later in the semester. And may I just do another angle on it? Because I'm always trying to also get out of the mechanistic angle of it, which is simply the greatest food in history is working class food. Food by peasants who have nothing. And we keep forgetting that half the things that are served in Chez Panisse actually started as peasant food. And Peasants have traditionally eaten the healthiest, finest food on earth. What a Lebanese peasant eats with a sun-dried tomato, what it means to make hummus. You know, these are not complex foods in one way. In another way, they're one of the most chemically sophisticated combinations of ingredients for nutrition, for everything else. And so I would also not undervalue and underrepresent how so many people all over the world living on subsistence actually eat beautifully and eat seriously. Now, I'm going to take starvation as another question because I mentioned that earlier of places where there is starvation and there never was. That's another story. But I want to also acknowledge what Michael said. You know, Coca-Cola isn't just a drink. It's also a corporation that is purchasing every mountain stream on earth so they will own all water which is something that even the villain in a Batman movie couldn't imagine, right? It's, we're, we're dealing with something where all these issues are charged, the way the money moves is so complicated, and you can't just look at the store price to imagine what it is you're buying or not buying. You know, what that Coke can represents is huge. And yes, Coca-Cola deliberately makes sure all over the world they're the cheapest thing in the market. Right? How that's organized and what that supports is very, very intense. So this is where I would ask you also to understand why they invited an artist here. is because also aesthetics are about nothing on earth is what it looks like. And if you're judging any book by its cover, it means you haven't read a book. And you have to understand no human being is who they look like. No human being is who they look like at all. And all the people who think they know you because they know what you look like and how wrong are they? Meanwhile, how wrong are you about all the people you think you know what they look like and who they are? 
All I'm saying is the reality is always a hidden truth. What we do in the arts, our job as artists is to say there's a story behind the story, behind the story, and behind the story. Right? And you know this from anything you just told your mom on the phone. Right? Well, there's actually a story behind that, which you're not telling her. You know, in your own family, there are stories behind the stories behind the stories to say nothing of the Coca-Cola Corporation. Right? To be human is to say there's something else, there's another reality that this surface is masking. And so, again, one of the reasons art exists is to get people into the habit of piercing the surface, not treating the surface as reality, and understanding the surface is actually illusion, and reality is much deeper. And life is calling to you, inviting you, and demanding of you much deeper things than that surface. And your life gets important when the surface collapses and breaks, and suddenly you're desperate, and you have to find resources you didn't know you had. That's when you start living. Not all three of us will answer all of these questions, but this was, this was such a core, core question to this course as well. So when it comes to what Michael said, something we also have to understand is the intersection, intersectional nature of poverty, right? Because if you are living in a world where over the course of decades the wealth gap has grown to the point where not only can you not afford food, you can't really afford anything else either. Home economics is no longer taught to your children, so the time that you don't have because you're working two jobs now, you also can't teach them how to cook. Also, depending on how Americanized you are, maybe your cultural food habits that taught you how to cook really good, very pure food with the food grown in your backyard and all of the dried goods that you have on your shelves, you no longer know. Because now that you have to work two jobs, you have to microwave food for your children. All of these things cascade to create the world that we live in now. And so what I would throw back to you and what I would throw out to all of you is something that Peter actually said. We now live in a world where we have allowed the government to subsidize the worst food. And if it doesn't apply directly to you, are you just going to go get that job that will allow you to afford a meal at Chez Panisse? Or are you going to fight so that everyone can actually eat? We've created the situation. And Alice Waters has enough common sense to actually charge what food is worth and say, pay because I'm not not paying my people period I am not running a restaurant where the people washing the dishes don't make a living wage that is brave as far as I'm concerned because there are people who can pay for it and it is our job to create a country where that can exist everywhere and it doesn't have to be a hundred dollars a plate because everyone deserves to get paid and everyone deserves to eat well Just to give a very, uh, one more concrete example, in Skid Row, we have the largest population of homeless people in America, right? They're all pushed to downtown Los Angeles. A study was made last year that right now we are spending an incredible number of millions of dollars to arrest these homeless people for jaywalking. As you know, they have to find a cardboard box every day to sleep in that night. The fire department comes in and hoses the cardboard boxes at 5 a.m. and you spend your day getting a new cardboard box, etc., etc. It is degraded, it is demeaning, it is disgusting, it is humanly repellent. We have put people in subhuman conditions, right? And we're arresting them so they go, they get fined for jaywalking and sent to jail every other day. Now, this idiotic system for one half of that money that we're now spending on Skid Row with the LAPD, we could give every homeless person a clean apartment, feed them three times a day, and get them medical care for one half the money. But we choose the spectacle of fear degradation and destruction of a society, a lack of humane values, and in the process, demean our own humanity. The cheaper choice, dollar-wise, is the humane choice. And we are making, in America, every day the most expensive possible choice 
in something that is degradation itself. And I want to get more voices into the room, and so here's what we're going to do. Three people are going to ask questions at the same time. I'm going to repeat the questions, and then we're going to tackle them, okay? Because I want to get more questions into the room. I saw some hands, one back there, two, and then three. Go. I'll repeat your question. Okay, so if we stop buying Coke, they'll say, eh, whatever. How do we actually confront and tackle this big question of corporations when they sometimes seem like God? He has a story about that when you're ready. Next question, gentlemen up here. Wow. Okay. So he'll, he'll repeat it when he answers it. Okay. <laughs> Last question. Stand up and talk really loud because I want people to get it. That was actually in the same vein. All three were actually in the same vein. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, the last question, uh, Micah will take, and, 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 and Nikki will take more seriously than I, more profoundly than I. Uh, uh, just to say, my plea when I was sent the signal that I had no more time was against oppositional culture. Okay. So, yes. It, yes. Yes. And yes, step one, here you are at Berkeley, please get to know your counterparts in the law school and the business school because there are very progressive people here who are doing amazing things and your generation is gonna write the new legislation, your generation is gonna create the new business plan and so please get to know the progressive people right here on this campus. Don't just sit with your foodie friends, really do. Go over to Bolt Hall and get to know who are the smartest people and how are they doing it and work in solidarity with them. Meanwhile, the Coca-Cola Corporation was taken on by a group of women farmers in Kerala, the state in South India, and the women farmers won. They sat for four years in front of the gates of the Coca-Cola bottling plant in Kerala province until it was a scandal. They had a great, great, great slogan, which I have to say is a pretty good one. This is where you can use an artist. This is a good one. When you drink Coca-Cola, you drink the blood of people. That was their slogan. <laughs> and they got the Supreme Court of the state of Kerala to shut down the Coca-Cola bottling plant that was stealing the water from everybody's farms. And those women won against the Coca-Cola Corporation, first group of people anywhere on earth. And they did it through determination and through deep conviction. And that happens, right? And meanwhile, this question of education is the question, you know, of, of, of our people, how, when I'm saying people are making food choices, there are a bunch of people who are not informed, and so therefore they can't make an informed choice because they're not informed. Again, in Hindu tradition, there's no such thing as evil, there's just ignorance. Right? And so one of the, our rules when we say speech is light 
what you're here to do is to talk to people and to spread the word and to speak and to make it powerful and open this up because the more people that hear it of course the more people respond and once they realize what an informed choice is people will make an informed choice most people actually want to make the correct choice once they understand what's in play so the task is education which is why this is called edible education I haven't gone into Alice Waters genius plan because you're gonna get that from better people than me but the Literally, the edible schoolyard will redo the economics of organic food in America and redo the educational choices of a generation. And I will just say something I learned last Wednesday, which is three days in the edible schoolyard, they do a totally amazing experiment using the kids as the research team and as the uh, subject. First day, they go and they buy ring dings, uh, you know, uh, ho-hos or whatever they are, and bring them into the classroom, and they use those in the edible schoolyard as their snack that day. Two hours later, they interview the kids about how they feel. The next day, they have a sweet, like, pastry-type thing they cook, make, whatever kind of sweet, fun snack thing. Two hours later, they see how they feel. The next day, they have a really beautiful piece of fruit. And the students test each other for how they feel. And the students themselves can tell on the ring ding day, two hours later, they're hungry, thirsty, and tired. On the fruit day, they're fine. Now, when that's part of growing up, and nobody's telling you something, but you're noticing it yourself. And when the right choice is within reach, is actually at your fingertips, instead of the system we have now where the wrong choice is at your fingertips, and it's a giant, colossal mental effort to imagine what a right choice would be, let alone find it. That's the beginning of change, and that's Alice's incredible plan, and I think it will go very far. I want to just, uh, we, we need to wrap up, and I just want to follow up on a couple of those questions, because I think that there were three central, central questions. I'm not going to answer them now. I want to encourage you, though, to hold them in your mind for the next several classes. Uh, to, to reframe it, the idea is, is individual choice enough? Is, is a change in consciousness among people like you and consumers enough to change the world around food, or do you also need uh, legislative, regulatory change too. Where does it come from? Do we build an alternative food economy that sits next to the industrial food economy or must we tackle the industrial food economy? That's a very big tactical and strategic question. And, um, and then this question of the role of corporations too. Another very, very important question. Contrary to what the questioner uh, posed about Coca-Cola, I actually think these corporations are terrified of you. I've seen a lot of evidence, especially in food. They are very, very nervous about what's going on. They want to get ahead of the curve. I have seen even McDonald's uh, in this country uh, moved by animal rights groups to change their behavior in very important ways. Um, you have more power with corporations than you realize, and we'll, we'll get into that because we'll, uh, Walmart will be here, and uh, we'll, talk to, uh, we'll talk to them about that. But let us wrap up by these. So these are themes of the course that we'll be getting, getting to. And, but let us end by thanking Peter for his inspiring talk. catalyst. But then I thought, well, enzymes kind of break things down. They take complicated molecules and break them into simpler ones. And that's one of the things he does. But he also brings things together. And he ferments change. And then I decided he's more like a yeast. Um, and he is a yeast. I mean, he starts with the substrate of a Shakespeare play or an, or an opera. And he ferments it. And it ends up something recognizable but very different. But then looking at him, there's some electrical metaphor we need, too, obviously. So you'll, you'll decide on the proper metaphor after you've heard him. But please join me in welcoming Peter Sellers. Hey, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Welcome to... 
class number two. Now we're going to get real. Uh, we just have to, I need to know why you're taking this class, right? Because, of course, it's easy, it's fun, who knows? But, obviously, something else is really going on in the world. And we're here, I mean here on Earth, to move things, to change things, to transform things. The nightmare with education in your generation was the idea was education was something to prepare you for a career so you could make money and have quote unquote security. Today I really want tonight to deal direct with two things which are truth and art and beauty. <laughs> because actually they're really important. We're living in a period where you're mostly surrounded by lies and most everything you encounter is propaganda. Somebody's trying to convince you of something. So everything is front-loaded and basically what you're so Petrini nailing that word. Because we're not alive, we're not on earth to be part of an economy. And the idea that you are looking at the entire world through a set of glasses that have grids and spreadsheets, and you're judging good and bad based on numbers, is an ethical crisis. The Greeks could smell that money was going to destroy democracy. And therefore, Euripides and Sophocles, in play after play, in every play, there would be speech against money. Euripides would say, no one could possibly confuse money and freedom. Because money is slavery, not freedom. What I want to deal with tonight is the non-cash economy, which is the only thing that actually functions and has ever functioned that keeps the planet going, which are all the things you do not because someone pays you, but because they're in your heart and you choose to do them, because they're who you are, because in the act of doing them, you become yourself. In the act of doing them, you tell yourself who you are and what you care about. And you make time for them because there's nothing more important in your life. And no one can pay you to do them because the reward is you finally get to meet yourself, who you're hiding from most of the day, most days of the week. The self you've been waiting to meet emerges when you do something that you're not paid for. That is an act of love, it's an act of generosity, it's an act of giving, and it's an act of self-definition. You learn what kind there is no such thing as a social sphere in the United States of America right now. That has been destroyed. The idea of public life and public space, everything has been privatized. There's a law that you can't stand longer than five minutes on a piece of pavement. Everything is for sale, especially including democracy. And we're now in this marvelous period where democracy is kind of a nostalgic concept, but we're in the Greece of post-Pericles, right? Where there was democracy and then it turned into what the eight richest people want to see. And we're there now again. And so you have to know what you're doing. Because all the things you grew up with that are written on the post office turn out not to be true, and maybe there won't even be a post office soon. So we really have to get serious about thinking what we're doing and how we're doing it. And it's not just that you're going to flow out of this institution into a series of situations that are waiting for you. They're actually not waiting for you, and you're going to have to invent them which is really cool. What I explain usually to my students at UCLA is the way you can tell the difference between something that needs to be done and something that does not need to be done. Anything you can get paid for does not need to be done. 
Anything for which no job currently exists is urgent. And so not only do you have to invent your job, you have to invent the ecology that supports it. And I'm using the word ecology instead of the word economy. Because the word economy is a crisis. You had last week, Carl, hearing is money talk. And when money talks, it has a very narrow range of subject matter. I really want to emphasize that money and life are not related. And anyone confusing money and life is going to have a really sad life. My generation had a strange situation. When we graduated from college, Citibank was waiting to hire us. The devil was there saying, sign on this dotted line. Your generation doesn't have that problem because you won't have any jobs. Now that's fantastic and truly liberating, right? Welcome to the meltdown, right? You watch the economy be propped up ridiculously a couple years ago, and guess what? 10 seconds later, it collapsed all over again. Why would that be? Perhaps because it is actually, by definition, unsustainable. We're doing things that actually never worked ever. And we're always bad for most people. And the reason in your lifetime all this stuff is collapsing around you is because it was never good. And never good enough. In our generation, it's not a question of going back to some time when this was done well. It has never been done well enough. And so the collapse means, how do we reinvent something way better than it ever was? How do we reimagine it? Today, um, on its face, you wouldn't quite, and, and reading the syllabus, you may have wondered why a theater director, an opera director, should be here speaking at a course about the food movement. Um, and I asked Peter that question, and he says, well, you need all types, including the unqualified in this movement, um, to really make it go. And I think there's something to that. It is an amateur movement in the best sense. Um, I'm not going to go talk about his achievements, which are reflected in the syllabus. They're considerable. They're amazing. And this will really depress you. Many of them began while he was your age, uh, when he began staging important works of the canon at... Um, at some of our best repertory theaters in America as a college student at Harvard. Um, since then, he has uh, fulfilled all the early promise he, he uh, manifested, but he's done a lot of things that you may be less aware of. He's taught a legendary class at UCLA in art and social change. Um, and in fact, during one semester of that class, he, he, he did uh, an entire semester on food issues and agriculture. And I had the honor of, of, of attending it, as did Alice Waters and Eric Schlosser. And so actually, he's given a whole lot of thought to these issues. Um, but I think why it's particularly interesting to hear from him is he has a very expansive view as to what politics are and the relationship of art and politics, which he sees as intimately entwined. And if we are to change consciousness around food, we're going to need the skills not just of the politician or the activist, but of the artist, uh, of the brilliant metaphor and the stunning event. And, um, and, and that's why uh, Nikki and I both thought that this was a very important voice for you to hear. Um, in my mind, I think of, of, of Peter, I've been trying to think of the right biological metaphor for him, and I thought for a while he was an, he's an enzyme. I mean, he's a, uh, you know, he's a...